and welcome everyone to the 2021 New Orleans Poetry Festival. I'm Bill Lavender from the NOPF board. Before we get started, we want to thank our major sponsors for this year, especially the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation and the Academy of American Poets who've helped keep this year's fest free and open to all. Glad to see you with us at this event and hope to see you at many others we are hosting throughout the month of April. All you have to do to attend is go to norlapoetry.com. <clears throat> Excuse me. And click on an event. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Tyrone Williams, who's gonna moderate this session and will introduce the rest of the presenters. Tyrone, great to have you with us. Thanks, Bill. So welcome everyone to the session, which is entitled In the Likeness of Authenticity, Poetry, Appropriation, and Identity. Before I do my sort of formal, um, introduction to the session. I just want to let everyone know that two of our presenters, uh, Tom Marshall and Alan Golding, had to withdraw at the last minute. And so um, I think we will still have a dynamic and interesting panel with our remaining panelists, Gabriel Gutting, Jean Hewing, and Linda Norton. In the interest of time, uh, I'm going to forego uh, formal introductions but I hope that we can have a lively uh, uh, conversation around their presentations. And we're going to go alphabetically. Uh, so we'll start with um, Gabe and then uh, Jean and then Linda. That will be the, the sequence. And then we'll open it up to general discussion. So um, let me um, give you my uh, sort of the genesis for this uh, particular session which as you know, uh, was supposed to have been uh, a year ago uh, uh, around this time, well actually in a couple of weeks from now. So I'm gonna to refer to an essay from 2019. In her October 24th, 2019 essay, quote, fascinated to presume in defense of fiction in the New York Review of Books, novelist Zadie Smith offers less a defense of imagining and inhabiting the lives of others, characters and people unlike her in every possible sense, gender, sexual orientation, race, class, ethnicity, nationality, etc. Then a description of her own writing practices and personal prejudices <clears throat> She criticizes, for example, the culture of likeness that one can only or should only write about, inhabit the bodies of people who are quote unquote like us in terms of sexual orientation, gender, race, class, etc. At the same time, because fiction is, as she writes, indefensible, she acknowledges that her understanding of fiction may well be passe. With all this in mind, to what extent, if any, does Smith's analysis pertain to recent debates over likeness, over staying in your lane vis-a-vis -vis poetry? To what extent is a popular phrase like, quote, cultural appropriation, end quote, both a tool of analysis and as Smith suggests, a form of containment that orients and predetermines conclusions. This panel proposes to address these questions through a number of modalities. And even though Tom and Alan are not here, I'm still gonna read uh, my descriptions of what their projects would have been like. And this still might be useful, useful for those of you who are familiar with the writers that they were going to uh, concern themselves with. For examples, as concrete examples of how American minorities 
have deconstructed the one-way stream of white appropriation of the other's culture. Alan Golding and Tom Marshall examine the consequences of the other's body and language in their respective proposals. Golding analyzes the way that Chinese American poet, a poet Timothy Yu, himself at the center of recent controversy around cultural appropriation. Uh, you might recall that a couple of years ago, uh, Tim um, was very critical of uh, what he considered to be white appropriation of, of ethnic and particularly Chinese uh, culture. In a, and then had to deal with a number of Facebook uh, attacks on him. So anyway, uh, Timothy Yu himself the recent, at the center of recent controversy around cultural appropriation takes on the white male trope of appropriation in his 2017 book of poetry, 100 Chinese Silences. Mm -hmm. Yu reverses and parodies not only the status of the Chinese poetry of Ezra Pound, but also more recent white male attempts to write the other. And here I'm referring specifically to Billy Collins and Tony Hoagland. Tom Marshall takes the question of, of cultural appropriation to one of its more logical and absurd ends, Sun Ra's positive appropriation of outer space culture. Marshall argues that Sun Ra deploys negation throughout his performance poetry to reverse and critique received concepts of history culture, and even life, opening up a space as outer space whereby Black Americans are able to retrieve lost or suppressed cultural legacies. Marshall demonstrates how Sunrise, Sunrise Canny legacy continues today in the orchestra of Marshall Allen, suggesting that the work of historical recovery is just as crucial today as it was in the mid 20th century. Zooming out from the specific to the general, and I hope this is still correct because now I'm going to refer to you three, Gene Hewling's revision of Olson's projectivist, projectivist poetics and Gabriel Gutting's inter interrogation of translation as appropriation dovetail at what both writers regard as the status or uh, positionality of the body. Hewing's proposal stresses that the movement of projectivist poetics begins with a body in a certain position slash location and ends with a writing through an engagement with other bodies and thus other modalities of the other's language, dialect, lexicon, accent, etc. As manifests in and through writing. Gabriel Gutting, a multi-language translator, suggests that while all language acts, including writing, are forms of appropriation, speech, and writing are connected to, quote, mutually vulnerable bodies, even as some bodies, he notes, are more vulnerable than others. Both Hewing and Gutting insist that the question of cultural appropriation demands a vigilant ethos insofar as the appropriation of the other's language is forthwith a partial appropriation of another's body. Of course, I wrote all this before I invited Linda Norton to join us. And so we will all be surprised, wonderfully so, with Linda's presentation. All right, let's start with Gabriel. Uh, thanks, Tyrone. And thanks to Bill for hosting. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation, it'll take about 20 minutes. Let me start my... Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing, so that's bad. Hmm. Wait, hold on, let me see if... Uh... It says one participant can share at a time. As long as nobody else is sharing, you should be able to... All right. Well, it says, when I click on it, it says host disabled 
participant screen. Really? Do you make Gabriel a co-host on the participants? Then my bad, my bad. Okay, it's my bad. Oh, there we go. All right. There you go. Thank you. All right, we'll see if we can do this. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Cool. All right, so translation, cultural appropriation, and the problem of non-being, um, or on purposely mistranslating Gunnar Varnas and the lesson I learned from doing so. Um, oh, by the way, today is the uh, birthday of Christopher Smart. He was born this day 299 years ago. It's kind of interesting. All right, so the problem, um, I purposely mistranslated a keyword in a in a really important poem um, by, and he's going to be embarrassed because you hear um, the renowned Norwegian poet Gunnar Varnes. Um, whoa. Uh, and um, knowing in general the kinds of attention, uh, God, this stuff, this, uh, you guys can't see this, but this, there's this little stuff all over the screen um, that Gunnar's poetry would attract because of its remarkable quality. Um, and knowing too the kinds of attention this particular trope that he uses would attract given the recent controversies surrounding Lionel Shriver, Zadie Smith, Yasmin Abdel Majid, and the attention to microaggressions in Rand Keen's work, I felt I needed to address this with Gunnar. And so I, I, do the, do what I did what translators do, I made a choice. In this case, it was a bad one. Um, and this is the poem in question. It's um, uh, the 35th poem in the book, Jesus Gassart Drum. Uh, October 2015, and um, it's a really weird poem, as many of the poems in Gunnar's uh, book are. Then uh, Met Alla is the name of his book. It came out in 2018. It just means uh, friends with everyone. This is Gunnar up in the upper right, in case you, <laughs> you might confuse him with the other uh, uh, characters. These, this is some of his artwork. Uh, just a brief introduction about who he is. He's a, a, a Norwegian poet, translator from English, Russian, and Bulgarian, an editor, an illustrator, a visual artist, a musician, and cabaret performer, and a writing teacher. Um, as translator, he's recently um, translated works by C.A. Conrad, Terence Hayes, Alice Notley, and from Russian, he's translated Gennady I.G. Um, when he's interviewed on NRK, which is Norway's NPR, it is done with some variant of the phrase "en of som tiden the poeter," one of the greatest poets of our time. Uh, Morten Longland in the paper Classic Compton calls him "en av vare desertet mest tonan givende, givende lyrika de sista shua orena," one of the most influential poets of the last 20 years. Um, and this this particular person, uh, and this is going to totally embarrass him, but. Uh, uh, Norsh Pausis Wonderboy. Um, <laughs> uh, he's, um, his, his poetry, this particular person says, is um, uh, surprising, disturbing, and, and uh, characterized by distinctive linguistic playfulness. Um, he's considered a difficult poet. Uh, the Chilean Norwegian poet, novelist, and translator Pedro Camono Alvarez says he's one of the best poets. He's the best poet of his generation, and he calls him a wizard. Um, and so translating Gunnar uh, has been really fascinating. And um, this is uh, his latest book, O Scriva Er Abbe Om For Me, to, to, uh, to write is to ask for too much. It's a huge book. So he's very, very prolific. This is uh, some of his artwork and his poetry from the last 30 years. Um, this is sort of a range of the kinds of um, writing and artwork that he will do. Um, this is all from the book in the lower left. Um, so a little bit about um, this book, Friends with Everyone, to just to contextualize um, my, my choice around this particular word and the kind of conversation that fell out from it. Um, the book is an expansive book. It's by turns virtuosic, madcap, manic, hysteric, historically minded, heartbreaking, political, and lyrical. It is a study of allegiances and betrayals, both interpersonal and tribal, familial trauma, childhood sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, physical abuse, and the emancipatory work of poetry. And at base, the book concerns not only how to write in the midst of empire, but how to write from the depths of misery about realities and events that only the dead or the stricken can witness. Um, so, all right, so this particular poem, um, it, um, it begins by a reference to uh, Jan Gossart, who's a Flemish painter, 
uh, on, on your left, uh, which I, I was struck by the similarity between uh, Glossart's portrait and the one there that Gunnar's uh, depicted by. And then on the right is one of the most famous paintings by, by Glossart. But in the poem, uh, Jan changes to Jesus. Um, as with many of Varnas's poems in the book, uh, the dream of Jesus Gossart uh, deals with empire, migration, revolution, struggle against the state, and the wish to live a free life, uh, a life free of molestation and oppression. The poem begins with a group of migrants, Gunnar's great uncles, in fact, buying steerage class tickets for an ocean crossing, departing Norway for America. And in the course of the poem, and this is what is interesting to me about the poem, and this is where um, Gunnar and I uh, had a really rich conversation that led to my thinking about this particular presentation. The speaker, presumably Gunnar, becomes his uncles. Then he becomes a folk singer and a revolutionary from South America. Then he becomes in the dream, the Chuvash poet, uh, Gennady Aiji. And I'm trying to remove this, then Gennady's sister, who translated the Bible into Chuvash. And then he becomes a black activist in America. Uh, the poem ends this way. Uh, for first gang i den och drönnen, så är jag upp på handen av minnet och tänker, jag är ju svart så märklig. Hvis jag verkligen var svart skulle jag icke läka märka till det på den maten. And for the first time in this dream, I am looking at my hands and I think, but I'm black. How odd. If I was really black, I wouldn't have noticed it, at least not in this way. And um, so... We got to talking and um, the next day, I think it was the next day, Gunnar sent me a poem um, and it's called Samho, Unity. And um, starts off, you know, some years later, my American translator changes the word svart to abject. And when we meet on Skype to fine tune the poems, I try to correct him. It's not abject, I say, it's svart, black. Like in James Brown singing, I'm black and I'm proud. He says, yeah. I was trying to save your, I didn't say skin, I said your ass, because when you say that you're black there at the end of the Jesus poem, that won't go over very well with people here. And I ask why, but I know why. I ask why, but I keep on talking. I do see what it looks like I'm doing, donning the skin of a black person and the poem, a black face minstrel show. That's fucked up. The fact that my own safe body is hiding in an unsafe body. It allows me to find some insight where others have lost their lives, a death claim by which a supposedly smart poet can somehow dictate and demonstrably become whoever he wants to be in this and other poetry collections, thereby taking the place of the hero and the places of the many heroes in this and in many other stories. But this poem came to me in a dream, I say written down, just like I dreamed it, because it wasn't I who was the hero. I was only looking through the eyes of the hero. Um, and he says further, I see that too many things here on earth are being forced into the form of a so-called person who tries, like everybody else, to make a hero out of their own fluttering dust and sweep together their different faces into one and the same dreamed face again and again. And in this way, yet again, manage to eat in one try the whole world. Because dreams are not reasonable or fair, they are paintings painted right onto the eye, faces painted on faces, and worst of all, names written over names because dreams colonize. Then uh, a little further down, I shouldn't have noticed in the dream that I was black. And this is a, this is a, a line that I wanna come back to because it really woke some interesting conversation and thought. Um, and that's how I try to, try to scrape myself together on the right side of history, guest starring as a vulnerable person and hoping never again have to explain who it is I fear, believe and dream I am so I just have to keep waking up. And he explains uh, to um, his uh, pastor and Zimbabwean um, uh, teacher of the Mbira that he was in the dream many people, first his uncles, then a Chumaringa type called Jesus, who was a folk singer and revolutionary, then Aiji, the great Chuvash poet, who himself resembled Moses, then he becomes his sister, and finally the activist from America, who's of African descent. Whoa. So um, um, this is, the, this is a se the sentence, the phrase I wanna come back to. If I was really black, and this is he's talking about in the dream, I shouldn't have noticed in the dream that I was black. And this is something that um, 
got me thinking about the grammar of bodies in different different contexts in different countries because if you're black in America, you're going to notice it, um, and, and because everybody does, that is the condition, presumably, of blackness in America. Um, it signals and is constituted by a history of pain. Um, one of my favorite writers is a former student of mine, Jonah Mixon Webster, um, whose amazing book, Stereotype, his first book just came out. And he's got a, an epigraph in one section of the book by uh, Sadai Hartman um, from the book Scenes of Subjection. As w and this is uh, in, in relation to that last uh, utterance of Gunnar's. Um, as well, we need to ask ourselves why the sight of suffering so readily lends itself to inviting identification. Why is pain the conduit of identification? And I just, it's just a brilliant question. Um, uh, and this is um, the, the cover of Jonah's book. This is uh, when it was published by Osada, the press dissolved recently. And uh, has, he's since signed the book with Knopf. And in this poem, Black Existentialism, number 12, um, The Bad Nigga Blues, he's speaking about the fact that he is and he isn't what he is and isn't. I always was. I always was being a nigga, even when I wasn't. And then this um, talking about the way that um, he's interpolated and um, called into being and addressed in a kind of Butlerian sense, Judith Butler, um, is very fascinating to me. And it made me think about that line um, from Gunnar's poem. Um, if I was really black in a dream, would I notice it? And it seems to me Jonah's answer is, hell yeah, you would notice it. Um, uh, he recently won the Wyndham Campbell uh, Prize. And if you haven't seen his, um, his wonderful piece of auto theory in the, in the latest Yale review, The Hauntologies of Slavery, I really encourage you to do it. It really brings to mind Hartman's uh, um, ep, you know, ep, epigraph about suffering and the way it calls it calls into being um, identity, and uh, it's the first chapter of his dissertation. It's it's uh, heart wrenching and brilliant. Um, this is uh, actually the a pick from the defense of his dis, by the way. So he's on the far right. Um, the person on the far left is my colleague uh, Ricardo Cruz. Person uh, just to my right is Dr. Der Derek Harrell from University of Mississippi, and that. The one between Derek and Jonah, that's my daughter, uh, Cleo. Um, so the problem, what is the problem? Um, what is wrong, if anything, with the impulse behind Zadie Smith's utterance? I wanted to know what it was like to be everybody. Um, and uh, I, I wondered, what is the difference between a white American man reading out loud from a poem written by a black American poet, Jonas, or a white Norwegian poet writing down a poem that came to him in a dream in which he finds he is a black American? Um, in a sense, Gunnar's confusion is Zadie Smith's, and I don't use confusion in the pejorative, but in an aspirational sense, to be confused, blended with. It is also Jonah's. Jonah's just as nonplussed by this as Gunnar is, or seems to be, or if not just as in degree, then maybe so in kind. In his poem, at least, Jonah's bad at being what he is, as he says. He isn't and is what he is and isn't. And so there is this difference clearly between Gunnar's confusion and Jonah's, and it's not subtle, and it's not meant to be. Um, my thing is stuck. What else is new? There we go. So, and the, this confusion is, I think, uh, really well described by Zadie Smith in her essay that um, Tyrone uh, referenced, Fascinated to Presume. But frustratingly, there are no fixed rules to regulate this process as to who gets to represent whom. We know some representations are privileged and some ignored. Prejudice in these matters must be thought through each and every time. Is this novel before me an attempt at compassion or an act of containment? Smith and Schreiber and Abdel Majid are most concerned with representation and fiction. Who is representing and being represented? But when we speak of Varnas and Mix and Webster's work, we're speaking about potential violence imagined and real to the poet's bodies. If we speak about the politics of representation, we must speak about the grammar of bodies. And so that grammar, <clears throat> the truth is that whether we belong or not, whether we are represented or represent or neither, there is a grammar to identity, one which does have, despite what Smith contends, rules. Some identities render some of us primarily subjects, subjects in Paul Cockleman's sense, agents who represent, add and break, do, 
affect, make claims, and some identities render some of us primarily objects, targets of police violence, identitarian appropriation, ventriloquized and the unheard voice. And so the difference is when we speak of suffering, we invoke as Hartman claims identity. Uh, and when we speak of that, we invoke the subject. We speak of the subject, we invoke the universal. And this is, this is where I was really taken with uh, the conversation Gunnar and I had about the, the nature of the universal. Well, we didn't have that, but this is what we're thinking about. And, and we really don't understand the universal well. Um, it's under theorized. And if you went to grad school in the 1990s, as I did, it didn't exist for you. Um, and I've been reading Todd McGowan's book, uh, um, which he recently pu you published recently about the universal. And um, for, McG for McGowan, the universal, the only universal in a sense is our non-belonging. Um, and this is the book. Um, let's see, I'm 15 minutes in, I'm, I'm good. Oh, so he says, the great political ideas and movements of modern world, of the modern world were founded on a premise of universal emancipation. But in recent decades, much of the left has grown suspicious of such aspirations. Critics see the invocation of universality as a form of domination or a way of speaking for others and have come to favor a politics of particularism, often derided as identity politics. Others, both centrists and conservatives, associate universalism with 20th century totalitarianism and hold that it is bound to lead to catastrophe. McGowan argues that universals such as equality and freedom are not imposed on us. They emerge from our shared experience of their absence and our struggle to attain them. And he says, despite the accusation of identity politics directed against leftists, every emancipatory political project is fundamentally a universal one. And the real proponents of identity politics are the right wing. So the issue is for me, our notions of literature and language are still rooted in a classically liberal ideology um, even our, our creative writing in the United States uh, is founded on this. Uh, the first person to teach creative writing by the name, that, that uh, phrase in the United States was Hughes Mearns. Um, and he wrote two books about this. He was a disciple of John Dewey, Creative Youth and Creative Power. And he said that creative writing was the best means to affect the transfer of experience from person to person. The idea being that we're all isolated from one another and it's the most difficult thing is to understand another person. This is a misprision of John Dewey's um, book of 1930, I think it was for Art as Experience. Um, Mearns was a disciple of Dewey and the advent of creative writing in the United States occurred in this context. Dewey, works of art are the most intimate and energetic means of aiding individuals to share in the arts of living. Civilization is uncivil because human beings are divided into non-communicating sects, races, nations, classes, and cliques. Um, and these are the covers of these two books, um, How the School Environment Set Free the Creative Spirit. And <clears throat> um, yeah, these were two really well-known books. So the issue, again, our notions of literature and language are still rooted in classically liberal ideology. Dewey and Mearns both drank from this trough. And according to McGowan, Liberalism's fundamental starting point is an atomistic view of social order. Whereas a universalist position <clears throat> is that there is a universal and out of that subjects appear. The advent of creative writing, excuse me, in the United States had bizarre similarities to the advent of philology and translation studies in what became Germany. Uh, each language as a vessel holding its own folkgeist. And um, this goes back like through the 19th century, this, this notion of language and through the Einfühlung theorists, starting with Herder, then Schopenhauer, and then Nietzsche, and then uh, Friedrich Theodor Vischer, and then Robert Vischer, uh, and then Johannes Volkelt, who actually was like so fucking confused by everybody talking about Einfühlung in these different ways. Is it, uh, do we, when we think of another, do we project our own mood and emotion and cognition onto that, that being? Or do we actually perceive it? So he had this, he came up with two terms for Einfühlung, Stimmungs Einfühlung, Mood Einfühlung, or actual Einfühlung. And then Theodor Leaps, who influenced uh, Gilles Deleuze. Um, <clears throat> so the issue again, in a sense then, <clears throat> our very notions as to what languages have prevented us from grasping <clears throat> and comprehending the grammar of injury that literature speaks through. I'm just gonna mute myself for a moment. Um, and it does seem to speak through a grammar of injury, and we forget that, I think, to our peril. 
Um, so what literature is, I can't believe I actually have a, 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 a slide that begins what literature is. In sum, um, I think we think literature is a testimony, an example, a specimen, a blueprint of experience. And I think that what literature is more accurately, uh, uh, it's a complaint, a remonstration of sorts about experience's absence. And I wonder if literature is itself an artifact signaling the absence of a universal experience. Um, maybe its job in a sense is to remind us as uh, that our universal is our own non-belonging. If as Yasmin Abdel-Majid says, the ultimate question centers around how we can know an experience we have not had, perhaps one answer is that we can become aware of our mutual absence, this community of absented beings um, when we perceive through literature, the grammar of injury that our identities speak with and through and against. Uh, um, and if we don't realize this, this can lead to um, what Rankine would call ethical loneliness. This is an essay of hers by that same name. This is the title page and this was given to me by Gunnar. He sent this uh, and um, this is the last slide. And she suggests that um, uh, we can take these lessons from literature um, as a corrective um, and that guilt and defensiveness are bricks in a wall against which we all perish and they serve none of our futures. And uh, so her sense is that um, in this call to, to feel this loneliness that we all have, um, we should do it without feeling um, uh, unnecessary guilt, I would imagine. Uh, I'm sure some guilt is good for us and, and, um, and eschewing defensiveness as best we can. So I think that's the last slide, yep. All the way, stop share. Good. All right, Gabe, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. All right, Jean. You, you have to unmute yourself, Jean. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. so let me begin. Again, thank you, Gabriel, for your paper. And thank you, Tyrone, for um, proposing this subject and um, sponsoring us today. And thank you to Bill Lavender for running the technology. So um, my talk is probably a little different than what Tyrone said. I actually like the way Tyrone really whipped up my proposal uh, in the proposed panel. And if only I could say that much, I would be thrilled. Okay, so um, I'm going to be addressing words to start with. So mine's a little different. Um, I'm going to start first with the concept and word authenticity. Uh, then I turn to likeness and the body. And I conclude with a few thoughts from Alfred North Whitehead and Charles Olson's projectivist verse. And um, so beginning with the word authenticity, okay. For me, authenticity is a word and concept that arrives from the high heavens of the past and is laden with glamor and anachronism. I don't entirely disown authenticity as a kind of placeholder for much that is lacking in our existing culture. The value of authenticity asks of a writer that one's inner feelings and outward feelings correspond. It also demands a sense of self-developed through self-knowledge and reflection that presents the self's ideas and politics in the public realm in good faith, no hiding behind the private. So all this seems pretty good, yet authenticity is very much a philosophy of the individual for the individual. Indeed, authenticity is imbued with the patina of individual rectitude in all its glory 
So it is not a concept or word I tend to use. Yet I'm highly alert when I understand inauthenticity to be parading as authenticity. In writing the signs of this inauthenticity are shallowness, woodenness, and hypocrisy. I did some investigation into the word authenticity, the AU I thought might signal gold, a gold standard, but this is not what I found. The etymology of AUT connects authenticity to the words author and authority. And indeed in an early and now rare usage of authenticity, there is the quality of being an authority or being duly authorized. AUT, aut, connects it to the Latin octor as designating a person who approves or authorizes, a person who has weight as an authority, an informant, a leader, an originator. Very interesting to me was that it also signifies increase and divination. This seems to take us quite a distance from common understanding of what is signified by authenticity. But in taking a step back, wasn't it there all along authenticity as the one who can increase oneself in relationship to others and otherness? the one who can divine, who is a diviner, okay? So now I'm going to go to likeness. Once though we get into the territories of increase and divine, I need to ask, what about the body? Are we not also our bodies? The discussions and definitions I found of authenticity had very little to say about bodies. One rarely thinks of one's body as a likeness. It somehow seems a basis for all that one is. Thus say for Nathaniel Mackey in his essay, Breath and Precarity, breath is not a metaphor, but is connected to the actual breathing of poets and musicians. And for black singers such as Al Green, who, who is who Mackey connects to the chokehold. Mackey writes in Bedouin Hornbook of Green's falsetto as an attenuation of voice, a way of saying in so many words, I can't breathe. Mackey relates this production of the falsetto to an alchemization of the legacy of lynchings. Is likeness ever enough when we have bodies and bodies with different experiences? So I'm, I'm challenging um, the New York Review essay, but largely from the point of view of poetry. Um, I granted that Mackey was writing a piece of fiction when he made these claims, but he's talking about a singer, okay? So this takes me to Alfred North Whitehead. This brings me to two concepts that are beyond or outside of the limitations of authenticity and likeness. The concept of a self or subjectivity changed by what is outside the self as having its existence in perpetual becoming. Two, the, the good, the, the great qualities of projectivist poetics as tied to the body and to all manner of sentience. So the first white head notion of subjectivity comes to us actually through Steve Shaviro. So what I'm about to read is part Steve Shaviro's explanatory prose 
and part quotation of Whitehead. And this comes from Shaviro's book, Without Criteria, Kant, Whitehead, Deleuze, and Aesthetics. Okay, according to Shaviro, Alfred North Whitehead marks an important turning point in the history of philosophy because he affirms that, in fact, everything is an event. The world, he said, is made of events and nothing but events, happenings rather than things, verbs rather than nouns, processes rather than substances. Becoming is the deepest dimension of being. Whitehead uses the term prehension for the act by which one actual occasion takes up and responds to another. Prehension is close to perception. Self-identity, the relation of a subject to itself is grounded in prehension. I continually prehend myself. I renew myself in being at every instant by prehending what I was just a moment ago, between a tenth of a second and half a second ago. Such an immediate past is gone, and yet it is here. It is our indubitable self, the foundation of our present existence. I am only the same, only able to sustain a character to the extent that I continually and actively take up this inheritance from the immediate past. My self-identity or the manner in which I relate to myself is the expression of such an inheritance, the process by which I receive it, reflect on it and transform it again and again. So those of you who know Charles Olson and Projectivist Poetics, you'll sense we are definitely moving into the territory of Charles Olson. Um, I have written about Olson's Projectivist Poetics and revised, I didn't revise them, I actually understood them differently and expanded them. So if what I am saying in short interests you, check out my book, The Transmutation of Love and Avant-Garde Poetics. Olson, as I just said, was of course much influenced by Whitehead. Projectivist poetics is nothing more nor less than a method of becoming in response to the totality of one entity, bringing to writing bodily feelings and cognition, body, feeling, and cognition, body, sentience, and cognition. Olson famously noted that the poet should try to get rid of the lyrical interference of the individual as ego. And he enjoined that one perception must immediately and directly lead to a further perception, to which I add in my expansion, but I think this is implicit in Olson, that one language phrase or word must immediately and directly lead to a, a further language phrase or word, one sound to another. Projectivist poetics involves introjection, since the projectivist poet writer is responding to what was just prehended, perceived, just written. Uh, projectivist poetics, this is where I take some movement away from Olson, don't have to be faster. In fact, they might be a little slower, and perhaps Olson himself occasionally was slow. Um, as long as the preceding perception is the causation for the next perception, language, etc. So I think what's great about projectivist poetics is that it's a process of becoming whereby one 
perception language event prompts and becomes the next perception language event. Um, so what is important is that one perception or one piece of language must directly lead to another. Projectivist poetics enable writers to engage without professing received ideas, representations, and forms through a writing which transforms meanings through the movement of the writing itself. And here I think uh, Tyrone did summarize well um, what I'm trying to claim for these poetics, putting them in different words, which I appreciated. So um, this happens only through an entity that is a libidinally bodily connected writer who proceeds in their writing by interacting with any of a number of cultural givens, including language itself. So rather than an authenticity that rests somehow in an individualism, projectivism is in a kind of post-humanism imagines a subject who is changing, capable of change. Um, yet while this process enables, even demands an evolving subjectivity or self, a becoming self, becoming subject, becoming something other, becoming animal, becoming woman, <laughs> that is never stabilized, what to make of the writing itself. For instance, is Olson's writing of a white man locked into his own whiteness, spinning it out in ever whiter shades of pale? I don't think so, and the purpose of this isn't to critique Olson, but I'm sure one can find a lot of whiteness that one could object to or query. Um, ultimately, I think in any writer, one would, white writer, one finds a lot of whiteness, okay? Ultimately, of any writing, the writer and reader must ask rather specific questions. What is respected or disrespected in this writing? What is being claimed through this writing and for whom and how? What might one make of this new thing, this new entity or the hybridity that emerges? So that's it. Thanks, Jane, that was wonderful. Okay, Linda, thank you. Hi, um, that was great. Thanks, Tyrone, for inviting me. Um, I didn't prepare a talk exactly. Um, my my book is called Whiteout: Love and Work, and um, I think Tyrone knows it. Um, and um, I'm just going to pick something from Teju Cole from page 246 of this book. Uh, Marcus, who, this is a nonfiction memoir, 80% memoir and 20% poems. And a lot of the poems are documentary poems, uh, Chenti. Um, and uh, I should also say I'm, I'm a visual artist as well as a writer. And I'm gonna show you what kind of my working wall is right now, if I can get it to you. Uh, so, uh, so for me, these issues of appropriation really started with making collages from existing works and uh, WPA and FSA photos, which in themselves have been subject to much analysis in terms of the photographer's relation, especially uh, Walker Evans and James Agee in their book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Um, so the, the Cole quote, let's see if I can find it.
Marcus, who is, that's a pseudonym for my son, has been giving me piles of old photographs he finds in dumpsters, hundreds of snapshots and formal portraits of black people, stranger. I don't know what to do with them. This week I read an article by Teju Cole about found photos. The quote is, I had the sense that my possession of these pictures was not their ideal posterity. And back to me speaking, me too, but now these things are my responsibility. So I guess uh, one thing I would say in relation to this discussion of appropriation is um, it's not so much about rights, it's about responsibility. And uh, the word respect has come up here. Um, and in writing this book, um, you know, I knew that I could be criticized. Uh, so I kind of, beta tested a lot of this material by posting it in the notes section on Facebook. And I'd leave it up for maybe a day just to see who liked it. Uh, I didn't need praise. I just needed a kind of nod like, yeah, do it, keep going. And that, that kind of armored me a little bit. Um, and so the poems in the book, some of them come from uh, are entirely made of Yelp reviews of California's, California's prisons and jails uh, from a wet Bible I found in 2007 in the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Um, one that's dedicated to C.D. Wright that's really an essay in a way, um, draws on the WPA histories of enslaved people um, and then there are a couple of poems that are made just from the um, stage directions for Raisin and the Sun. Um, but the issues of who can see what, who can say what, are throughout the book. Um, and the kind of the inspiring writers for the book are, are James Baldwin, Zora Neale Hurston, Alice Childress, and Toni Morrison. And of course, I'm very interested in Toni Morrison's playing in the dark and her writing about Flannery O'Connor and the, the complexities of what you do with legacies, imperfect ones, uh, that, which are all, that they're all imperfect. It's just a matter of who's going to point that out and how. We don't know what's going to happen after we're dead. Um, so I also, in the last book, which was called The Public Gardens, um, I quote Dizzy Gillespie, if you can hear it, you can have it. Can you? You know? But I mean, music is really, um, music and lovemaking really are places where people he have to hear uh, in order to get anywhere with the other participant. So, um, Notice I didn't say sex, but um, that's a question for me. You know, if I can hear it, can I have it? Um, I mentioned foolishness and uh, uh, partly the reason I wrote this book is because a very close friend of mine from college had said to me, um, why don't white people talk to white people about racism? And I answered her you know, some of the reasons why one might not do that. Um, but in a way, this book is taking up Valerie's challenge to me. And the, another reason I wrote it is because being in the world of poets, I don't find a lot of, um, there are millions of children who grew up in racist families of cops. I'm one of them. I don't see a lot of writing coming out of that experience. So I decided to try to do some of that. Um, and uh, so I definitely take William Blake's, um, if the fool would persist in her folly, she would become wise as part of my motto. I wouldn't have been living my life this way if I wanted to be, to always look like I knew what I was doing. And then, uh, since I 
mentioned Walker Evans and also James Baldwin, I noticed on this beautiful Instagram site that I love, Black Archives, this fantastic series of photos by Baldwin Lee, photographer I never heard of before. And uh, people really love them. And if you go to Instagram and you look at that, you'll see it's, they're black folks in the South in the early 1980s and black folks really love these pictures. And uh, it's not unusual for black archives to post without saying anything about the photographer that's, that's typical. But I looked up this photographer and I, I noted it was a, a Chinese American photographer who had studied with Walker Evans. So I, you know, I was thinking about these issues of who can see what, who, who, who is the medium, um, and that those issues of of coal. I didn't, I never used any of those photographs that I mentioned when I started here, but I did use a found photo for a collage that I made for Claudia Rankin, and she ended up using it on the cover of her book Plot. And that boy kind of stays with me and he appears all over the place. And I don't know who he is. I, I got him at the flea market at 23rd Street and 6th Avenue in New York City. So that raises other issues of appropriation which are writing about the dead. And that is a tough one for me. And I think for all writers, you know, an issue of responsibility and they're not here to to tell you, tell their side of the story, right? Um, and uh, I also have been thinking a lot about music and I kind of feel like it's, it should be impossible for me to give a reading or a talk without music. Um, but thinking about versions in reggae, I think I'm probably the only huge reggae and ska fan in the world who doesn't smoke weed. Um, so I'm, I'm always like completely sober, nodding along. And I love um, the fact that as soon as a song comes out, there are versions of it, versions and versions and versions. And you'd hear it in, in Brooklyn uh, at the carnival because soundtracks would be going down and the same song would be changing in, in real life all through the day. And version also, as you may know, is something midwives do when the baby is in the wrong position, they would do laying on of hands to shift the baby into the right position. So there is that interaction and that, that really impossible thing that's going on between the outside and the secret inside, you know? Um, and I also, of course, I, I'm, I'm surprised you no know, one mentioned it, but um, think about Dana Schutz's painting of Emmett Till uh, at the Whitney in 2017. And, you know, and then Claudia Rankin also hosted a talk about that um, at the Whitney, which you can find on YouTube. And the curators who selected that painting were uh, Asian American. And it was a very complex situation in the dynamic there. Um, and I guess I would say, you know, I read Dana Schutz's um, comments about it and she said she identified as a mother. And I felt that was highly insufficient to be taking on that subject. Um, but um, in other words, I feel like she didn't hear it so she couldn't have it um, and she shouldn't have had it. But ultimately the issue of, there was a lot of talk about how the painting needed to be destroyed. Hannah Green talked about that. And I wrote like lots of uh, Alan Capro like scenarios for how, who was going to destroy this painting of Emmett Till? You know, it's, it's one thing to say that, but it's another thing to physically destroy a painting of Emmett Till's face. So those issues, uh, hit me. And I think the other thing in terms of rights and responsibilities is instead of thinking about entitlement, think about permission and where are you getting your permission? Um, and 
the hauntologies, you know, uh, the issue of heroism or savior stuff. I mean, these are all things that I think about a lot and we can talk about it more afterwards if you would like. Um, but I, I think some of these issues are um, about a physical thing, literal cross-pollination. You know, the first time I ever heard about um, John Wiener's or John Berryman was from August Wilson, you know, who'd read everything and everybody. And uh, even though I would sometimes feel like, wow, 10 plays and I think maybe Bynum is the only white person, the people finder in the 10 plays. And then I, uh, I feel like I was kind of learning a lot about making art by watching how those plays came out. Um, and realizing that everything is there, everything is there, everything is in there. Um, and that that is part of the way art works. And then the last thing I wanna share is when the book came out, I, it was a terrible, terrible year, right? To publish a book like this. I mean, it was a good year actually, because it ended up that people somehow had the capacity to think about COVID and think about Black Lives Matter at the same time. Uh, in a way that was astounding, but it remains to be seen what, what happens. Um, but it was a terrible year because you're so alone when you're writing and you wanna be out with people and you wanna be talking with people and listening to other people about what matters. And that was very difficult to do this year, of course. The book uh, came out in like April. So um, two young writers, sent me lists of questions because we were thinking about doing interviews and I never really answered them, the questions, but it seems like this question goes back to what Gabriel was saying. And I'll just read this question from Ruth Wilson Gilmore and then just make one note about linguistics because those things come up in both presentations. Um, in a, and this is Nate Klug, the poet who's also a minister. In a recent interview, the prison scholar Ruth Wilson Gilmore draws a distinction between a view of resistance which, in which only certain demographics of people are authorized to speak about, speak from, or speak against certain kinds of horrors, and a, review of, and a view of resistance in which after the death of Mike Brown and Freddie Gray, leaders said quite simply, when Black lives matter, everybody lives better. Gilmore uh, I'm sure you all know a carceral geographer who I published when I was an acquisitions editor at UC Press and she's a friend and an insp inspiration for this book. Um, Gilmore adds, I endorse completely reinvigorating the notion of the universal. Do, and then Nate asked me, do you share Gilmore's interest in reinvigorating the notion of the universal at this moment in time? If so, I'm curious how you think universality might be redescribed in opposition to or in tension with whiteness, which I think is a great question that I'm going to try to answer someday. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say about that fascinating discussion about blackness in those poems that you translated, Gabriel, that, um, I, I also, I teach in Ireland, I teach online in Ireland and, um, and there's a, a jazz show that's in, on Mixcloud that's in Irish, it's called Anoda Gorm, which means blue note in Irish. And I write about that a little bit and about the fact that um, in Irish, the literal translation for a black man is a blue man because the actual ancient words for black man mean devil in Irish. So anyway, the, the, the linguistic freight, and that was, uh, there was a tiny but quite lovely review of Whiteout in our local paper yesterday by a wonderful writer named D. Scott Miller. And he talked about the linguistic issue of racism and how everything is loaded with it. And I would also add, you know, my white eyes see things in a way that they shouldn't see. They can't see right. And yet this is all, this is what I have to work with, you know? So um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Linda.
Okay. Um, I don't know, uh, Bill. How, how long do we have? Um, most of the sessions have been running about ninety minutes. So I would say, you know, we've easily minutes. have time for closing remarks or questions or whatever you want to do. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank Gabriel, Jean, and and Linda for invigorating, mind blowing talks because I was I was sitting here taking notes and we don't have nearly enough time for me to ask all the questions or make comments that I that I have down here. I wish we we did. Um, um, so, I mean, so let me just say a couple of things. One, uh, uh, in relationship to uh, uh, Timothy, you, uh, if you're interested in um, what some of the things Alan might have said about him. Um, not that you'll hear this from Alan, but uh, Timothy Yu is actually giving a reading for the Kelly Writers House on Tuesday, uh, the 13th. I, I think it's at 6 p.m. It's part of the series they're doing. So he'll be reading with uh, Susan Brianti, who's a good friend of mine, and uh, Simone White. Uh, uh, so um, anyway, that's just about that. Um, oh, man, I have so many questions. I mean, I really have, you know, uh, I don't know where to start. I just have too many questions. Um, I mean, Gabriel, let's, so maybe I can just ask one question of everyone and that's maybe that's a good way to do this. And then, um, because one of the things I was thinking about um, in terms of gun arts uh, work, which by the way, thank you, Gabriel, for introducing that to me. I'm going out and getting those books <laughs> tomorrow. It's, I'm fascinated with that, with that work and your translations of that work. But you know, it's interesting, the line, the line that you said about, um, you know, how, how would I know? And I can't remember exactly how the line is. Um, you know, was it mean that I have to think about the fact that I'm a black man or something like that in the in dream? Um, and it doesn't make any difference. And actually the line that you didn't um, cite, but I thought was most interesting is the line that follows that. It says, at least not in this way, that there's a, you know, that line, I think, which goes to your, I think your large, your, your, whole talk, which is about the distinctions, you know, um, in terms of that. Do you want to say anything else about that line? Or? Um, Tyrell, what was the question about? The oh, no, question? I just, I was just, at, no, it's not necessary to ask. I was just wondering if you had more to say about that particular line, at least not in this way. Um, yeah, I mean, that that line speaks, that particular phrase speaks volumes. I mean, yeah. because it opens up the door for all the other interpretations and all the things that he would have said that I would have said he wouldn't have said, you know, in this particular right. talk, you know. Um, you know, one thing about Gunnar is he's, he sees things uh, that, you know, I can't see. And, um, you know, I wondered where that, that thought might have led to in the poem, you know. Right. So yeah, and it's, that's precisely the issue. It's not in this particular context, in this particular way, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, really excellent point. Okay, uh, the other thing I should have said too about the uh, Zadie Smith uh, essay, the reason I, I mm -hmm. cited that a work of fiction in this context, a poetry festival, is because, I, because I've heard this said before uh, in several venues and you know, online um, too, in the New Yorker and the Atlantic, that on some levels, fiction writers, and Zadie Smith says this too, by the way, fiction writers have a greater uh, range of freedom mm -hmm. uh, in our culture today in terms of inventing characters and inhabiting characters than poets do. And one of the things I wondered about that was that, is that because of the lyric tradition um, that we have, that it's so much a part of American poetry history mm -hmm. so that we think of poetry as self-expression for the most part. And so that's one of the blocks to this notion of creating, because when poets do create characters like Tony Hoagland does or uh, Billy Collins and other poets do, um, they, you know, they get into trouble as we know in our particular cultural moment. So I wonder if genre was an issue here too. I mean, that was something I would have said, you know, in more, if we had been together talking about this more generally, maybe afterwards for drinks and so forth, but, um, 
that is something I really wanted to think about was um, because it, it, it was interesting that I was first of all surprised that this came up in the context of fiction, but then, um, so I was, you know, I was, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I was so happy to see that the fiction writers are struggling with this in the same way that the poets are, you know, that nobody escapes uh, in, that, in that way. But anyway, I just put that out as a general, uh, a general thing for us to think about. Um, and I, let's see, uh, in terms of, I mean, I had many other questions too, but I, I'll move on to, um, to Jean. So I wondered too, if you were thinking about um, Jean, um, the essay, that short essay by um, Olson, Human Universe. I mean, that seemed to be, that, that essay would seem to play a role in what you're thinking about moving beyond, what it means to be moved beyond the human, because, you know, part of Olson too, and I understand what you said that you're taking Olson beyond where he ended, so to speak. But I wonder if um, if his insistence on the human um, was a kind of obstacle in your thinking, because you didn't say that, but you seem to imply that to us in, to, in certain ways. Well, I mean, that's a good question. I think he's, I, you know, I have read some of Olson. Um, I think that there's a lot in him that really lines up with the post-human and I can't really respond to the human universe, but I would actually like to go back to your fiction poetry question that you were, your observation, uh, because actually when I first started writing this, I spent a lot more time thinking about the difference um, of a certain kind of poetry which is, um, of course, poetry creates personas and sometimes has characters, but not often. Um, and I think the thing that poetry can do, particularly experimental writing, is it can take in a medium without taking on all the problematic aspects of character formation. So that um, for certainly projective poetics and how you described what I wanna claim for projective poetics is an interaction with, with a medium, with a way of um, understanding. So for instance, Linda's question about, can I have this music? Um, I'm not saying it quite the way you said it, but if I hear it, do I have it? Um, yeah, Gillespie says, his quote is that you can have it. And then Linda's response to that, you know, which is so very conflicting response is, well, who gets to have it then? You know, it's, you know in that context, who, who can claim it? Right. That Gillespie is throwing out there. And I would say, I would say that we, first of all, we all have it, we have it differently, um, et cetera. But as a medium, music is more, um, and we can interact with it more, it's more internal, we can internalize it in ways that I think character um, comes with so much cultural um, signage, uh, particularly say as brought, brought out in the Rankin book Citizen, just that, that there's so much reaction to character. So um, I've always thought poetry was more gifted in relevance than fiction. Mm -hmm. That's a nice way to put it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Linda, um, so Hannah Black, you know, I sent you the, the note, this is the person you're talking about. Um, but I had, uh, so one thing I said about Dana Schutz is I've written, this is gonna sound like self-promotion, but it's really not. But I actually have an essay about her and um, I haven't published it, it's just, a, I gave it, actually I gave it at one of the last conferences I attended um, in, two, in the 2019. 
um, at the University of Maryland. And I was thinking about, because it was ironic for me, because I got invited to New York to do a, um, a reading with Hannah Black. Mm -hmm. It was right when all this was exploding. Mm -hmm. And so we had an interesting, and I was very, when I saw her essay, I, I sort of, I didn't attack her exactly, but I did sort of question her. The essay I'm referring to is the one in Art Forum where she says that painting needs to be burned. And she, she, was, she was backing away from that. She says she was writing out of anger and frustration. And she says, I don't think it should be burned, but I definitely think it should be removed from public view and mm -hmm. so forth. And so it got me to thinking about um, not just uh, the painting, but of course about the history of, of photographs of Emmett Till you know, in that, in his casket and his mother's decision to allow those photographs to be published nationwide. You know, you might recall that she wanted to, that was a deliberate decision on her part. Um, it also got me thinking about Lewis Till. Um, in fact, I heard a talk just the other uh, day about Lewis Till, uh, Emmett Till's father. Um, but anyway, that's all your, your talk made me think of those, right. those issues and those, those things. But in terms of, you know, so who can have it? You know, one of the things, and you know, God, I'll, I'll stop here and then I'll see if we have a question from the audience, is um, economics. Because, you know, you know, it's, I mean, on some levels you could say that it might be the case that fiction writers don't get in quote unquote as much trouble as poets do uh, when they create characters across lines, so to speak. Um, but poets, you know, because there's nothing at stake economically, there seems to be more at stake than on other in other spheres, as it were, that, you know, in terms of you can't say this or you shouldn't appropriate this um, and, and so forth. So I think I wonder about the economics of the situation, if that's, that's playing a role here too. Um, and I, I mean, you were much too modest, first of all, in your presentation of your works, Public Gardens and White Out, but be that as it may, because I think you have a lot more to say about these issues than, than um, you, you gave yeah. us. No, and it's been building up for more than a year, so don't get me started. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and you know, you probably remember, um, Tyrone, that in Whiteout, there's that scene where we're in the projects and mm -hmm. the neighbor gives my aunt right. a big stack of issues, back issues of Jet. Right. So, there's other things like when someone sees something they can and do misinterpret it. You know, there's a lot of stuff I didn't put in the book because I don't trust white people to see it the, the right way, you know? Right. So, there, but, but in terms of genre and economics, I mean, you said it, you know, the problem with putting that Schutz painting behind closed doors in a way is that the commodity fetish of the art world, sure. that's gonna escalate in value and it's gonna become almost this weird porn issue. So, you know, the whole idea of excision raises many other issues depending on the, on the genre, right? Right, yeah, going from painting to uh, fiction and then way, way, way down poetry, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> toward the bottom of the scale as it were. Yeah. So let me ask, uh, I want to open things up. Um, does our audience have any questions they would like to ask any of our three presenters? I don't see anything in the chat, but you can raise your hand electronically. Yeah, you can, you can raise a hand or you can also throw, a, throw something into chat into and chat. I'll, uh, I'll yeah. unmute you or you might even be able to unmute yourself. I don't even know. <laughs> I'm a terrible host in that way. So, I mean, it doesn't look like there are any questions. Um, so let me... What about Ruthie's question? Where did, I don't see it. Where's no, I'm it? sorry. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, that question, her question about the universal that Nate... Oh, but well, I'm glad you said it because I was actually going to say maybe we can close on the whole question of the universal since it came up in all three yeah. talks. To, to, uh, Reinvigorating the universal, what does that mean? Yeah, and uh, I like the idea of the universal as a sense of non-belonging, which I, in some ways, I connect that to the notion of identity as connected through suffering, which is, 
you know, that's been a big one that what we have in common is our common suffering, as, as it were, which seems to, you know, somehow intersect with this question of non-belonging, too. Um, do you want to say more about that? Okay. Um. One thing that really strikes me about McGowan's work is the, is this idea of non-belonging and how it, it accords well with you know Heidegger's notion of Geworfenheit, right, right. You know, just thrownness, this sort of right. sense of being feeling alien and different and apart from, um, you know. And obviously, you know, one doesn't want to construe. I mean, there's a way where that can elide, you know, the real suffering, uh, you know, that we're all talking about, you know. Um, so, but yeah, I, I really twig to it with regard to that Heidegger notion of, of Geworfenheit and just how much that's fed my understanding of experience and, and just what it means to be, you know, a confused creature. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, the, um, and we know that the attacks on the, uh, sorry, okay, I'll, 30 seconds and then we're out. <laughs> sorry, I'm looking at the time here. But we know that the attacks on the Universal too. You know, come at very specific points in in history. That's as you were pointing out in your in your presentation. I think about that in the context for me of the um, you know during the the, uh, the beginnings of the Black Arts Movement, for example, and the attacks on the writers that came before, particularly attacks on people like Robert Hayden and um, um, Ralph Ellison by a very young Amiri Baraka and other um, people from the who were just emerging the Black Arts Movement, attacking them precisely because they 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 were they were perceived as being too universal that they were not focused enough on the fight on the struggle, um, as it were, and so so I mean there is and then of course you talk about the political aspects of it too, so there is um, there is uh, this is a, a a subject that is just obviously too rich. We need not a panel, but we need a, a uh, an entire conference, perhaps around some of these sort of ideas. Yeah. But, great. Okay, Bill, then I, you're the ones who's going to do this, organize this. Yeah, I, I am, uh, or I'm going to try. Uh, maybe maybe next year uh, we can kind of uh, thematically focus uh, somewhere in this direction because this has been like one of the most stimulating. Um, the stimulating panels uh, I've been to in a very long time. And uh, thank you so much, Tyrone, for organizing it. Finished. And thanks to uh, to Linda and Jean and Gabe. Um, Gabe showed up early and I got to know him and uh, it was great fun. And um, uh, thanks to all of you who came and um, Thanks to uh, the Zoom bombers for leaving me alone in this session. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, and listen, um, show up tomorrow, and like every evening, you know, around dusk in April, uh, we'll have a session, and um, they're just all over the map, uh, but they're all great fun, and um, I hope to see you there. And thanks again to the, the four of you. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks, so, Linda. Thanks, thanks, Jean. Thanks, Gabriel. Bye, Linda. Bye, Jean. Thank, thank you. Thanks, yeah. everyone. And thanks, Tarun, for proposing the subject. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Thank you.